Improvisation in a Youth Marker Space de Vivita Philippine Experience. And that is going to be in a second in the screen. So a big round of applause for Gabe. Hola, me llamo Gabriel Antonio Mercado y Aliere. That's the most Spanish I can speak. Hola tú! But you see me everywhere. Mercado, 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 supermercado. <laughs> and I thought uh, to start this talk, I should give a little bit of a context on why I, why I have a Spanish name but do not speak it. You see, I am from Baguio City in the Philippines. And the Philippines was under the Spanish empire for 500 years. In fact, it started on March 16, 1521, when Philippines was discovered by Magellan. They were sailing day and night across the big ocean until they saw Isboli Masawa Island. When Majan Lin Lin led in Limasawa at noon, the people bet him very welcome on the shore. They did not understand the speaking they had then because Castilla Gid and Waray Waray man. When Magellan landed in Cebu City, Raha Humabun met him, they were very happy. All people were baptized under the Church of Christ. And that's the beginning of our Catholic life. When Magellan visited in Mactan to Christianize them, everyone. But Lapu-Lapu met him on the shore and drive Magellan to go back home. But Magellan got so mad, ordered his men to camouflage. Mactan Island, they could not grab Cause lapu, lapu is very hard. Then the battle began at dawn. Bolos and spears versus guns and cannon. But Magellan was hit on the neck and stumbled down and cried and cried. Oh, mother, mother, I am sick. Call the doctor very quick. Doctor, doctor, will I die? Tell my mama, do not cry. Tell my mama, do not cry. Tell my mama, do not cry. And that's the story of Magellan on the Isle of Mactan long time ago, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> that is the history of how Spain began in the Philippines and the end of Fernando Magallanes, Ferdinand Magellan in the Philippines. And it is in the style of a Mexican corrido. <laughs> and you might wonder why that is, because even if Spain discovered the Philippines for 400 years, the priests, the governors generals, the soldiers that were sent to the Philippines were all Mexican, not Spanish. And so when you meet a Filipino and think, oh, they're like the Mexicans of Asia, that is why. <laughs> and that is why I have a Spanish name, I act more Mexican, but I look very, very Asian. And that is partly why I named the school I put up in the Philippines Third World Improv. And a lot of people think, oh, Third World, that's a bad word. But you know, we embrace it. We embrace being part of the Third World, and we know the rest of the world has called dismissively economies like us, places like us, as ah, Third World. But we embrace it because we also have traditions of improv. We don't have names like Spolin or Johnstone but we have epic poems and epic songs just like this one, even in languages that are not Spanish, not even English or anything, but we have our own traditions of performance and on the spot and all of that, and that is why I sang it. And I've been doing that for 20 years with my improv group, 
And this is also a story of how I discovered my new incarnation in Vivita, which is where this will end. This is my group that I have been with uh, in the past 20 years, Fit. And this is a festival that we used to put up um, every few years. Um, Reggie has been there. Paul Z. Jackson has been there. Carla has been there to perform. Um, joyful, joyful improv. And um, I believe it is the only festival in the world where we required all performers to perform in their native languages. And we just said, like the Korean group performed in Korean, Japanese group performed in Japanese, Spanish group performed in Spanish, because we said, well, everywhere else, English is celebrated as the language of improv, and you have Western teachers and all of that. And we're saying, you know, the rest of the world, the third world, uh, and we're not saying it in terms of economic significance or anything like that. We're saying it the non-Western world also has many improv voices, and we are the home for that. Um, <laughs> during the pandemic, we had a conference called Improv is Asian, and it was all Asian teachers, all Asian um, performers there as well, because we have a voice too, and if we don't use it, then nobody else will notice it. Um, I'm also a single father. I'm a single adoptive father of a son, and those who have known me all these years know how much, how important it is um, that um, I have a very strong relationship with my son. We are the only two in the family. And that sort of gives context to what I do now, because I left all of that right before the pandemic, left consulting, left improvisation, and I now have a nine-to-five job in an organization called Vivita. And Vivita, that is my team right now, I now live in Baguio in the Philippines, away from Metro Manila, and I will use um, something I learned yesterday to describe what it is. I will use the high-five method from Terry, where are you? <laughs> On the top level, what is Vivita? Well, we are an international organization in seven countries. I am the co-founder in the Philippines. We are a makerspace and a creativity accelerator for kids aged 8 to 15. Um, what does that mean? What that means is that we teach kids autonomy. You go your own, do your own stuff, make your own clothes, make your own furniture, recycle your own plastic, go do it yourself. We don't teach you concepts, we teach you execution right away. And we've got the equipment to do that for you right away. We teach autonomy and we teach innovation in action. We don't teach kids to grow up and come up with a wonderful business model and then exit and then have a wonderful, great PowerPoint startup. No, we ask them to make shit and break shit. That's what we do. Third, well, what do we really do? Well, we have things like a book incubation program where we, right now, we have, we have 11 young kids and we take them from concept to, to writing, to illustration, to layouting, to publishing in less than two months execute right away. We take kids from um, incubation weekend to, product, to prototyping, production, to selling in two weeks. And they turn a profit and they execute and not too much. Oh, what about this? What about that? No, just shut up. Just do it and make mistakes. That's what we do. Um, and uh, we get into traditional arts like weaving, backstra backstrap weaving, really doing those things, doing, not speaking about it. And best of all, our product is free because we believe that everyone should have access to it. It is not determined by socioeconomic class. And something this free and this weird well, maybe we should make it free to make it, to, to make it even more weird and to really disempower the parents from saying, oh, teach this, teach that, teach that. No, we're free. If you don't like what we're teaching, you don't have to come here. Um, here's, a here's a video of how we are. I mentioned we are in 
Um, this was actually a mistake. I, up, uh, I loaded the non-audio version. That's why I'm speaking through it. But we always say kids are too small, too young. They never do anything uh, right. And they're always taught, taught, taught at such a young age. But Vivita is different because in Vivita, being kids is what makes them great. And this is where, what we've been doing throughout the pandemic and even beyond. Oh, there you go. Uh, there you go. So, everything from um, fashion design, to making drones, to electronics, um, to making your own robots, to making your own roller coaster. A kid in Japan actually made their own roller coaster. We do international concerts with each other, dancing, um, clay arts, arts and design, all of that. We have 3D printers, laser engravers, and we have a community of seven countries. We started in Japan as a reaction against the strict Japanese educational system, but we since spread to Estonia, Lithuania, uh, Baguio in the Philippines, where uh, I am co-founder. We are also in New Zealand, and we're Hawaii. And guess what? We have no metrics, we have no teachers, we have no curriculum. It's about making, listening, and focusing on kids and bringing their ideas into reality. And you can find out way, way, way more about us and what we do through the website vivita.ph and vivita.co. But what does that have to do with us? Well, I'm very glad that Robert Poynton was the keynote speaker this morning. And so it is a great, great opportunity to anchor what we do in his uh, Everything is an Offer um, thought about letting go, noticing more, and using everything. How do we do it? In Vivita, we let go of two things. We let go of us as teachers. We're not teachers, we call ourselves crew. And that means we have resigned ourselves to the fact and we accept the fact and embrace it that they will not learn anything from us. Their learning is not our responsibility. It is not our responsibility. We think of ourselves as like a library. The librarian is not responsible for your learning. The librarian merely makes it easily accessible for you to find books. Instead of books, we have 3D printer, laser engraver, a weaving loom. We've got arts and crafts materials, a t-shirt maker, a sewing machine, all of that. We guide you through that, but we don't teach you that. The second thing we've let go of is a curriculum. 90, 80% of the time, when you come to Vivita, it is free flow. Think of it like a co-working space where they don't determine what you do. They just give you the tools, the time, the internet for it. And that's what we do with the kids. And sometimes they come and say, I don't know what to do. And we say, great. <laughs> and we still don't guide them with that. Because we believe that boredom can eventually find your way to creativity. But once they want to learn about something, then we jump in and say, oh, this is how it works. This is how you use this software to 3D model something so we can 3D print something. We set what we call learning traps, half-finished projects here and there. And they say, what's happening here? Oh, well, this thing needs to be done. Do you want to do it? Oh, I'd love to do that to complete that project. That's how we do it uh, without having a curriculum and without having teachers. Notice more, uh, notice more, this is our idea to market program where we get kids' ideas um, in one weekend and two weeks later they sell it in a market and for this one they sold uh, about 800 euros worth of products in four hours um, from things that they never knew how to do before. Somebody knitted plushies, somebody made paintings, somebody made a prank horn and all of that. And I will tell you, half of their products were something that we, as crew members and members of Vivita, thought, oh, that's a stupid idea. <laughs> oh, nobody will buy that shit. <laughs> but we shut up. 
for example, in this one, um, Hubs is uh, over on the extreme right. He said, my product is a prank horn where if somebody sits on it, it will have a farting <laughs> musical sound. And we were like, okay, just the cost of, pro just the cost of materials, it's just too expensive, uh, and then you're selling it at 75, and maybe you'll make a profit of 10 pesos. Is it really worth it and all of that, and who will buy it? It was the first product to sell out that day. Um, for for uh, <laughs> another one, it was really just um, pesto. Pesto pasta, which is very common, and she even made it from Clara Olay sauce, not even her own, from the market. And we were like, what's so innovative about that? What's so different about that? But she showed so much grit, so much determination, so much customer service through all this that she sold the most also on her day. And I was the first to say, that's a bad idea. That's not innovating. That's nothing. But she showed grit, perseverance, and all of that. Because we notice more of kids, because our founder said, I do not want you to focus on what you're teaching the kids, I want you to focus on what you're learning from them. And once we took on that, that school of thought and that frame, we were automatically transformed. It's much the same way like when we're facilitators, we're not teachers. Instead, we bring out the learning. And to have that approach with kids is world-changing for them and for you as an adult. Treat them like an adult, and they will behave, and they will surprise you um, that way. And finally, use everything. The Philippines has many children. <laughs> many, many children. We're a Catholic country. <laughs> um, I come from a family where I have, um, where we are seven children. Ole tu! And my father is not Father Abraham, but um, we're seven children and that's very common. In the Philippines, there are many, many kids. And right now, physically, we're in one city. And so we thought, hey, we have to spread what we're doing. And so we started by partnering with, uh, in other countries, like, for example, Lithuania, there is a Vivita van which goes from place to place. And we thought, oh, in a third world country with so many places, that's not the, optic, the, the great solution. It's the Instagrammable solution, but it's not the, really the best solution. So what we did was we partnered with public libraries in the remotest parts of the country. And we come, we visit, we give this experience for one week. This was in Bontok which probably doesn't even have an ATM <laughs> in that city. And in four days, we had 280 kids. In another library uh, in Urdaneta, about two weeks before uh, I came here, it was 300 plus children, getting them into the experience of making, giving them agency, giving them autonomy, and spreading that education doesn't just happen in schools. It can happen in libraries. You don't have to be told what to learn. You can discover what you like, what you learn. And we are moving further by um, thinking that we are teaching these lessons at an early age. We tell people, don't be afraid to make mistakes. But our schools always penalize failing always penalize disrupt disrupting. And in schools, to get good grades, you have to get uh, you have to think in the box. And we are um, doing our part by teaching them these earlier and not doing it in schools. We're doing it in our own space and in libraries where self-directed learning, guess what, has been accepted for centuries and centuries already. And so we're spreading the good news by creating Vivita Corners or Vivi Corners in public libraries throughout the country, giving them equipment giving them access to equipment and working with local government to give them access to equipment, giving them access to materials, but more importantly, um, creating and facilitating and designing experiences where they are given autonomy, where they are given agency, where they are valued, not because of what they will, uh, the, not because of what we teach them, but what we learn from them. And finally, still very much aligned to how we do things, even in improvisation. 
So improvisation is all about being self-directed. Improvisation is all about being curious, having audacity and autonomy. And I'm very happy to do that with the organization that I have, Vivita Philippines. And these things I learned from this tribe. Thank you very much.